Okay, so um, I have the uh, the great honor of setting off the second day. So thank you all for coming back to uh, Banda Part Part Two. Um, uh, just very briefly for the ones who may not have been with us yesterday. I wanted to say that I am, my name is Raya Dell. I am the director of UKS. UKS is uh, the Young Artist Society, and we are basically organizing this conference. And in saying that, I should remember to say a warm thanks to the team of UKS. So I think we should give them all a hand for like setting up shop together with me. Um, and then I should say that I've co-conceptualized this conference together with Chris Sharp, Prem Krishnamurti, both in the front row. And um, yeah, we're excited to, um, I guess at this point, continue a conversation started yesterday about the independent institutions, the reasons, means, and rationales, and the why up against, or maybe within the framework or um, departing from next to adjacent to um, the institutional white cube, more traditional um, measures. Um, this we're doing in essence by talking uh, Turkey with 16 institutions that of which uh, I guess nine were speaking yesterday and seven will speak today. And they are speaking in five different groups, in five different uh, panels. Yesterday, Asakusa, Pivo, and Surfense at Skule talked about institutional sites and geographic context. Then we had Kunstverein, Lulu, and Praxis talking about institutional measures and spatiality timing formats. And then we had New Theater Primer and Signal speaking about the institutional bandwidth. Um, and then we're interpersing the different um, panels with Kim. So yesterday we were very happy to have both Lars Bang Larsen and Christine Tomei with us. As I said yesterday, the panels, the discussions are going outside in. So um, from the geographical context, the where, to the institutional measures, the what, to the bandwidth, the for whom. And then we come to today. So today's first uh, panel is going to be discussing the institutional voice, the expressed how. And there we're going to have Kunstella Lisabon, Luis Dani, and Artist Institute talking. And then we're going to go to uh, the life and death of the institution, the for how long within which um, 1857, Castillo Corrales, P exclamation and raw material company will be speaking. Um, as I said yesterday, this comes out of many different uh, motivations, but importantly, UKS has had a long-term investment in the independent art scene in Norway, setting up a funding scheme for independent institutions or lobbying for it within the Arts Council, but also having a series of talks under the um, title Artist Institutions, and then actually publishing a manual for how to seek funding in 2014, and that has just been republished, 2019, where you basically can read, you know, the uh, exact uh, small sort of tips and, and, and um, yeah, tricks for how to apply for funding. And, and I'm saying that because I should say that this conference, and I said this yesterday too, is the Trojan horse for a book. So basically we're collecting all the voices of the 16 institutions into a book. Everyone has written in advance about their institutions, answered to a set of questions. And that set of questions you can actually find in here um, on page, I guess. I don't know. Let's see. Did we have that? Ah, page five. Um, so written in advance. And then upon this conference, we will continue editing and thinking. And then hopefully in about 
uh, about by the end of this year, there will be a book coming out. Well, I think speaking of books is a good place to hand over. Uh, well, no, 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 no. I, there's important things to be said that I'm not saying now. One thing is, Modus Operandi has been within the conference to, after each of the presentations, you write that you write down questions on the little notes that are placed on the benches. Some you see on this table, Prem is ho holding up some. And then we're collecting those and we're taking questions from the little bulk of, uh, of notes. Um, so please, please keep on doing that. We're also collecting those questions, putting them up, uh, as you can see over there, so you can go and consult them after because not all the questions will be asked. And we will use that to, um, to come to the finale of today, which is to go to a workshop. So at 3.15, we will divide into smaller groups and and uh, and discuss some of these questions and then we'll come back and do a kind of plenum discussion in the the very end so please keep on writing down questions okay but book is a good um, place to to come to the next step of the program which is that uh, chris Krause will be speaking and basically also speaking about founding semiotext uh, or founding native agents within semiotext and being part of that um, but i wanted to before that get Prem up here and start us off with so, uh, for those of you who weren't there yesterday uh, as i mentioned back then come on we all most of us know what we're doing maybe you don't but stand up for a second as i mentioned yesterday uh you know amy cuddy gave this talk bunch of years ago now about the the efficacy of the power pose um and uh it you know, we can do either this way or with your hands on your hips but you know she gave this talk i think in 2012 a, a ted talk the only ted talk i've ever watched um but uh about how it changes your it changes the the biofeedback, the rhythms of doing a power pose before presenting in public makes you feel more confident and makes you appear more confident. Now, I used to do this with my individual speakers before running a panel, and then I realized that was unfair. Why is it that only the speakers get to feel relaxed and confident? Why shouldn't everybody else in the room get to feel that too? And so once again, let's all do a power pose together for a little bit less than the two minutes that's recommended, but we'll just hold Hold that for a second. Okay, great. Thank you. Just for the power pose. Um, and I have the great honor and pleasure to introduce Chris Krause, who uh, for I think pretty much everyone here needs no introduction, but nevertheless, a few words, Chris Krause. Uh, is a writer and filmmaker. Her novels include I Love Dick from 1997, Aliens and Anorexia from 2000, Torpor from 2006, and Summer of Hate from 2012. And her nonfiction includes Where Art Belongs, 2011, after Kathy Acker, a biography, 2017, and most recently Social Practices, 2018. Her films include Gravity and Grace, 1996, How to Shoot a Crime from 1987, the Golden Bowl or Repression from 1990, among others. Krauss is also known for having founded Semiotech's Native Agents imprint to publish fiction, mostly by women, in addition to groundbreaking works of fiction by writers like Michelle T and Anne Rauer. Native Agents has published notable volumes of poetry and prose by Eileen Miles, Barbara Barg, and Fanny Howe, as well as memoirs and interviews by Kathy Acker, Bob Flanagan, David Rattray, and William Burroughs. Uh, when I first read Where Art Belongs almost a decade ago, uh, it came as something of a revelation to me. 
It effortlessly departed from the anxious, often impenetrable art speak I had grown accustomed to slogging through and let me enjoy reading about art. I found its casual and personal mode totally refreshing. It was and continues to be as unapologetically brilliant as it is pedestrian in that it has a way of allowing art and its practitioners to actually live in the everyday. As one reviewer put it, Krauss's book does not offer manifestos, sweeping judgments, prescriptions, nor proscriptions. Krauss's nuanced approach is more akin to a cultural anthropologist who considers creativity in its natural habitats, the spaces where art comes into being, where collaborative and destructive energies merge to mount momentary feats of brilliance. Um, give you Chris Krauss. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, a better understanding after being here for an hour this morning, exactly what the conference is and what you're all doing and what the stakes are. Um, I don't personally have any experience of running an independent art space. I've written about several and been almost kind of a participant observer. But I guess, you know, my really deep involvement has been over the years as a co-editor of Semiotext. So I thought I might talk just a little bit about the, um, the three independent spaces that I've kind of, quote, studied and written about, and then maybe a lot more about my own experience with semiotext. Um, so I wrote about the space Tiny Creatures. It's very funny, you know, what writing, it, it's, it's very funny what kind of writing about something does to it. Um, tiny Creatures, um, and, and, and people, you know, I'm sure some of you who, who are art critics and write about art, you get this too. Um, I wrote about Tiny Creatures in 2010, and it was in my 2011 book, Where Art Belongs. Tiny Creatures was a very small, off-the-grid art space that I only knew about because, you know, my very good friend, Hedy el Kalti was pretty heavily involved, and I was kind of peripherally friends with some of the other members. Otherwise, I never would have known about it. And I remember the first time that I read that talk about Tiny Creatures, it was at Cooper Union in New York, you know, the, uh, the art program, Cooper Union. And during the Q&A, some of the students were really angry. Why did you choose them to write about? Why do you think they're important? You know, just because like they're unfunded, they're, you know, all these reasons about why you shouldn't have written about X and you should write about Y. And of course, you know, what artists don't understand is that like art writers, you know, it's not like handing out gold stars. We don't think that carefully about who or what we're gonna write about like anybody else we tend to think and write about what's at hand. You know, I was living in LA. My good friend, Huddy was part of this group. Um, I had the opportunity to write a long form essay because I'd gotten a grant from the Warhol Foundation. And it just seemed like a really good exercise to see if I could do a study of this group. I think at the time I had been kind of falling in love with the, for the Chronicle Forum. Um, I'd been reading, you know, chronicles of early English and early French history. You know, the chronicle is an early form of historiography. And I love that idea of like taking something, you know, a few years after the fact of its existence and trying to reconstruct as thoroughly as you could what happens. So, you know, and I've always been fond of case study ever since I wrote I Love Dick and, you know, had the idea that like I could be my own case study. I've always really liked the idea of like doing a case study that you can learn so much in the general by looking really hard at the particular. So I did this study of Tiny Creatures, the gallery, and it was just this tiny little storefront off the freeway um, in LA, sort of at the edges of Echo Park, just on the cusp of gentrification before Echo Park really started to be full on gentrified. It was it was all just kind of murmurings of gentrification and you know a slight foreshadowing of things to come. Um, Janet Kim had 
she grew up in a, a Korean immigrant family that was heavily evangelical Christian. She, she'd grown up going to church all the time. Um, she studied music and she went away to a music conservatory in Chicago. And during those years, she lost her religion and she moved back up to LA without any particular plan. She was living at home with her parents. And um, I think at a party, she met Matt Fishbeck, who had a band called Holy Shit. And Matt Fishbeck maybe invited Janet to play keyboards in his band. And out of this, out of the exposure to Matt and some of his friends, Janet had the idea that she'd get out of her parents' house and rent a storefront where, you know, the storefront could originally she thought of the storefront as being a practice space. So she, you know, used her credit card and she went to the storefront for not very much money. And it turned out that a lot of the people that she was playing music with were also doing various visual art projects in their spare time. And she had a storefront that nothing else much was happening in. It just occurred to her that, oh, we could show people's art. And they were also doing a lot of methamphetamine at the time, which involved a lot of sort of staying up all night and all hours. And there was kind of, within this group of friends, there was this sort of craft ethos idea that you sort of stay up on drugs and then do these craft activities. So a lot of this, a lot of, and that was, that was Paul Gell, that was Paul Gelman's contribution in a way, the artist Paul Gelman, known as Tall Paul. Um, his artwork had a very heavy craft component and he started leading these kind of very goofy craft workshops that people would go to and would give them something to do with their hands besides smoke cigarettes when they're staying up all night. So all of this was kind of like weird and circumstantial and took place among a group of friends. And they started to have public exhibitions um, Ariel Pink was part of this group, and Ariel Pink was studying at that point to become more known as the musician. And there was just a confluence of circumstances that somehow put this kind of tiny off the grid space briefly more on the map of people's consciousness as like this sort of new happening alternative thing. So, what fascinated me was like the narrative arc that you could look at retrospectively, you know, that it started as basically nothing. Janet Kim's kind of storefront apartment where she'd invite her friends over. And it had this escalation. And then this moment of like high glamor as being considered important and influential and the hot new thing. And then, of course, it had its inevitable deny demise where people's drug habits got out of control and some people became famous and other people didn't. And there were these falling out and these feuds and these ego fights. And then the space fell apart. Two and a half years later, the space no longer existed. So it just seemed like a kind of perfect American story of an alternative space. And because I knew the people, everyone felt pretty comfortable about talking about it. And so it was possible to reconstruct this history and tell it in some detail. And, you know, another question that I got when I went around to different places and cities reading this piece, and I always felt like I was channeling Janet Kim and channeling these people by kind of being their personal historian. Um, Another question that I got often was like, why do you think tiny creatures failed? And I never said it failed. I mean, just because it doesn't exist anymore doesn't mean that it failed. I mean, you know, these people were all like in their early and mid 20s when they started it. If they were 40 years old and still doing the same thing, I mean, I think that would be the failure. Um, some things are not destined to go on forever. And, you know, I it probably, it seems that maybe that's one of the topics like here this weekend is, you know, the idea of transience versus permanence, you know, longevity versus the ephemerality. And, um, yeah, I mean, my my, my opinion as, as, as a writer and, and a person and a critic is that not everything needs to be permanent to be important. You know, that some of the kind of fleeting things that are just impossible to sustain 
live on in our memory and as a part of our history in ways that are so indelible and so much more important than things that kind of drag on and on and on and on for years just because they like have the funding and you know they have to turn in the grant report every year and they have to have the board meeting four times a year. I mean, some things just like happen and then they stop. Um, that was also the case of the second, actually all three spaces that I wrote about no longer exist. The second one, Mexicali Rose, I encountered because I was like being such a good journalist. I thought I would re visit and research every single thing that happened at Tiny Creatures. And one of the things that happened at the end of the life of the gallery was they were invited by a friend of those, Marco Vera, who had been living in Echo Park, but moved back to Mexicali where he was from. And Marco's personal history really reflects like a big part of Los Angeles history. There's this whole community of people whose families for generations have been going back and forth between Mexican border towns and Los Angeles. And then Charlie work in Los Angeles and bringing bring money back to Mexico. That was Marco's history. You know, his father had, you know, lived in between Mexico and, uh, and Los Angeles for years and years. And Marco was, you know, living in LA, but he was kind of getting the vibe of, first of all, it was the election of Bush and the crackdown on migration, immigration, and this increased hostility towards the Latino community in Los Angeles. And he was just, and, and people already in Echo Park, families who'd been in Echo Park for generations being pushed out. Um, he was getting the feeling like, you know, it was not happening for him in L.A. anymore and he wanted to leave. So he went back to Mexicali and his uncle owned a house next door to his parents' house that his uncle had more or less abandoned. It had been taken over by um, low level, um, low level smugglers who were who were doing people smuggling across the border and selling fenced goods. And it was like it was a big squat. And with great using all his savings and great personal strength and resources and his friends network, he got these squatters out of the house and he cleaned it up. And his goal originally was to start a media workshop in his neighborhood. The neighborhood's called Pueblo Nuevo. And it, like Echo Park, had a long and rich history, a long working class history within Mexicali. And generations of people go, went, you know, went back for a long time, had deep roots in Pueblo Nuevo. His goal, because he had studied film and media, um, and he was working as a production assistant in Los Angeles. His goal was to go back and to work with kids, you know, who were maybe at risk of becoming gang members or becoming involved as, you know, um, working for narco gangs, um, to get them involved, to kind of save their lives through becoming interested in film and video. So originally it was meant to be a media workshop. And it was, and it was very successful. And Marco for years was supporting this space by working on the U.S. side of the border in Calexico um, in a government job, a nine to five government job, um, which of course, when he took that U.S. salary back to the other side of the border, went a lot further and helped him fund the space. So he was like, had two full-time jobs, his day job in Calexico and his real job running the media workshop in, in Pueblo Nuevo at Mexicali Rose. Um, a little bit further into the history, he met a friend, Israel Ortega, who was working at the um, state gallery, Sayart. And Israel uh, Castro Ortega had a lot of friends who were artists who had no place to show their work because Mexicali famously has like zero commercial galleries. So anybody who's an artist, and they have an art school, they have a great architecture school at kind of an architecture city, and they have an art program. Um, but anybody who's an artist who chooses to remain in Mexicali is kind of fucked because there's no commercial gallery. There's no way to show their work. The only place to show their work is in this, the, the structure of the state galleries and the regional galleries, the municipal gallery, you know, within the, um, the government structure. 
Um, so they decided to use the space at Mexicali Rose, which was quite large and accommodating, to put on these art shows. And that was when I visited. It was 2010. And they were having a group show called Puro Pusone, which was, um, you know, basically means a real character. And it was like an open invitation show. They would install anything that came in the door. And some of the installations were by professional artists and others were just by people kind of hanging around the space who thought they had some artwork worth showing. And I just fell in love with it. The opening went on until two in the morning. It was nothing like an art opening as I knew it in Chinatown in LA. It was more like a neighborhood block party. Um, all kinds of people showed up. And so I started going back and back and you know, writing about some of the shows when I could for magazines like Art Forum and Spike and international art magazines. And you know, I felt like that was the one thing I had to offer was that I could like give a little bit of international visibility to what was going on there. Um, but it was incredible. And like eventually in 2012, Marco Vera, Richard Burkett, and I um, did a show called Radical Localism, where we kind of basically ex exported all of Mexicali Rose into artist space in New York City. And they recreated a lot of the work that was going on at Mexicali Rose. And the artists of Mexicali Rose came over and did this installation in New York. And so that was just like amazing and deeply thrilling to see these street banners all over Soho saying radical localism, art from Puebla Nueva, Mexicali Rose. And, you know, the activities of the gallery just kind of got bigger and bigger as more people knew about it. Um, they started a radio station um, that very young people were involved in, like high schoolers and, and um, that age group, people in their late teens who were very political. So there was this kind of political wing of it. It was called Radio Paraje. And, um, and then other people from the Newsweekly Zeta, the incredible, legendary, courageous Newsweekly Zeta that has done a lot of incredibly courageous reporting about politics and, and narco trafficking in um, in Mexico, people from Zeta became involved and it became this huge thing. It wasn't just media and documentary film. It wasn't just visual art. It was, you know, activism. It was politics. It was journalism. It was radio. It was all these things. And, you know, it too kind of came to a head and people came to prominence. And then Marco got sick of living in Mexicali and decided to move back to L.A. and became involved with the activist group Defend Boyle Heights. And eventually the space fell apart. So it had its life, too. Um, Samuel Tex, on the other hand. The enterprise that I've been involved with since. 1989 and was founded by Silvera in 1974 was never that intense. I'm talking yesterday with Constanza and with Venke. You know, Venke was talking about her amazing book that's about to come out in German um, about her involvement with the Auto Mule commune AAO. I mean, that was a total commitment, total intensity. They lived together, worked together, broke down all boundaries between art, life, working, sleeping, living, relationships, non-relationships, sexuality. It was absolutely totalizing. And I think the secret to semiotech longevity is that it isn't totalizing at all. Um, Severe being European, um, had this idea very early on with his, his early exposure to Americans and American culture made him think that the last thing he wanted was for it to ever become a collective. Because as soon as it becomes a collective, everybody's fighting for their share of what this whole is. And he didn't want that. Um, so there would be groups of people involved, but he was always very clear that it was his project, you know, he was the editor-in-chief. It was his project. Um, and he wasn't really, you know, he was, he was into sharing a lot, but he wasn't into sharing total ownership of the project. It was always going to be his thing. And it was for a long time. 
until, I don't know, Sylvia and I were living together, I guess, since 1985 in, in into part of the 90s. In For 10 years, maybe we lived together. Um, and during this time, Sylvia stopped doing the magazine. He founded it in 1974 at Columbia University as a journal with his then partner, Susie Flato. They were living together and they had a study group that was like kind of not part of the institutional activities of the French department at Columbia, but it was a group of graduate students and younger faculty who were interested in post-structural theory. And out of the study group came the idea for the journal Semiotex, which at first was an academic journal of post-structural studies. The first issue I think was about Saussure, and then they did two issues about Nietzsche. Um, it wasn't until I think 1976 that kind of exploded um, and this kind of following the course of Sylvia's life and Susie's life also into kind of the uptown, downtown world um, with the schizoculture issue. And that was like the first kind of implosion of like high, low culture theory and art, um, downtown and uptown. The schizoculture issue, which was republished um, in the last decade by, it was Hedy Alcalti's idea who joined us later, and I'll get to that later. Um, but the schizoculture was like the first manifestation of like what sem semiotics would eventually be, which was this place where kind of high theory could exist with underground culture, could exist with music, with like, porn well, not por pornography, but with art that used a lot of graphic sexuality. Um, so the schizoculture issue was amazing. It was Louis Wolfson, it was Kathy Acker, it was, you know, people from the 70s, avant-garde. It was Leotard. It was Guattari. It was everybody all smushed together in a way that nobody would ever have thought of before. And a group of people made this magazine over, they worked together for more than a year, you know, in this way that was possible in New York at that time where people could live virtually for free and they could work for free for months and months and months on a project that would never have any particular financial return that was paying only in cultural capital. Well, by the early 80s, this group of people had moved on and they needed to kind of get on with their lives and careers and they couldn't work for free anymore for all that time. So Silver had the idea to do the foreign agents books and that was something that he could do alone. He didn't need a whole group of people working together. He could just do the books as he wanted in his own time. Um, so that was the beginning of the Foreign Agents series. And he started off by publishing Baudrillard. Um, Baudrillard, the first book in the, in the Foreign Agents series was Baudrillard's Simulations. And that was kind of a brilliant move on Sylvain's part. Simulations didn't exist as a book in French. It was a compilation of what Sylvain felt would work best with American readers. And um, his idea was to present theory brut. There would be no translator's preface, no afterword, no introduction. It would be just the text. Um, and simulations really, really hit a sweet spot at that moment when it came out in 82 in the art world. Um, artists picked up on Baudrillard's work in a way that like academe wouldn't do until years later. And then he followed this in rapid succession with works by Deleuze and Guattari, by Elias Tard, by Foucault. He did this whole run of French theory before French theory had entered the academy in the US. Um, Silver had published maybe 12 titles by the time I don't know, 1989, I'd been living with him for maybe four years and seen him work so intensively on this. I'm like, Silver, why haven't you published any women? And he say, there are no women doing French theory. And I thought that was weird. Well, you know, what about Kristeva? And what about Lucy Rigore? And he's like, they're psychoanalytic. Psychoanalytic doesn't interest me. So, okay, they're off the table. And... um that gave me the idea that 
maybe it wasn't theory, and I didn't know that much about theory anyway, but I knew a lot about writing because all my friends in New York were writers, and I was working at the St. Mark's Poetry Project, and I knew people like Eileen Miles and Lynn Tillman and Ann Rauer who weren't that well-known at the time, um, but whose work seemed to be like this manifestation of the radical subjectivity that French theory was talking about. But really, I mean, I also wanted, Semiotech was so fashionable and so cool at the time. And the work of these women was sort of tainted by the stigma of the poetry world, you know, sort of poverty, East Village. It was a very, very parochial, insular kind of readership for this work. And I really wanted to bring it to a larger audience. So I thought, well, we could make up a story about it. We can call this work Native Agents. and will say that it's the analog to French theory, that it's the American radical practice of French theories of subjectivity. And so with Sylvia's great cooperation, we started the Native Agents series that I edited beginning in 1990. And we published the first round with Cookie Mueller, Kathy Acker, um, Eileen Miles, Lynn Tillman, Barbara Berg, Anne Rauer. And up through the 90s, that was what the Native Agent series was. It was like mainly first, I didn't want to make it exclusively female because that would link it too much to second wave feminism, which seemed really kind of like icky and like your mom's feminism. We want it to be kind of tougher and harder. Um, and I was very adamant that this eye would not be an, a memoir eye, that it would be a tough public eye, like an adventure eye, looking out and exploring the world. So. Up until Hetty joined us in 2004, it was that. It was like the girl books and the boy books, French theory and American, mostly female first person fiction. And we read a play about it um, that, that Thomas and I would like to act out for you now. Um, it's called The History of Semiotext. Instead of writing an essay about the history of semiotext, um, Sylvia and I just kind of hung out in bed one morning and turned the tape recorder on and then transcribed it. So this is the history of semiotech, actually part one, because we've done several other versions and Hetty and I have done a version together, although not in bed. Um, but this is the first history of semiotext. Is it? In a way, is there? Oh. These are light. Yeah. That's better. Um, okay, this is the history of semiotech. Part one Silver's First Dream, June 12, 2001, Los Angeles, California, 7 30 p.m. Could you tell me about the dream you had last night? What was the dream? The dream about not having sex. Because you see, I was disappointed. I moved the bed around here in the room so that everything could be different. But we were having sex. We were just, we didn't go beyond the crepuscular. Crepuscular dawn. That's the title I thought of for the book you're doing with Paul Virilio. It's very trans, like a tequila sunrise. Pineapple juice getting mixed up with a grenadine. But I think the dream was about being middle-aged. Let me describe my dream. I never dream. But for the last two nights, I remember my dreams. In both dreams, there is a communal situation. A big room, like a loft or an office, with people coming and going. Nothing is private. And in the first dream, I was trying to make out with someone. I just remember the white sheets pushed aside, the mattress on the floor, People were passing and I was kind of annoyed, but somehow having sex didn't seem so important. Like in Kafka, the country doctor. I was looking between people passing by. The bodies themselves were not so important. And then last night, I was in another of these huge holes, but I was lying on my back with my sex erect. You mean your penis. Oh, I hate the word penis. As soon as you become physiological, it's not much fun. So that's all the fun. I mean, I was like the Egyptian needle. You mean you had a great big heart on? 
Yeah. <laughs> and you are overing above me like the sky? And how can you penetrate the sky? That's a beautiful dream. So then it's not just it's not just you and me. It was people moving around doing their things and I was trying to do mine and it didn't matter if it went anywhere or not. It was a feeling of energy and presence and there was a point. You don't always have to try to make a point. So that's the history of semiotics. Exactly. The Red Army fraction wanted to make a point and it was taken away from them. You can only take a disparate action. Disparate action, desperate action. Wasn't that the title of your first play? Yeah, that was how I met you. Of the 10 famous people I invited, you were the only one who came. What was it about? It was about coming to the East Village from Wellington, New Zealand, and realizing there wasn't such a thing as politics anymore. In New Zealand, I was a teenage Maoist working for trade unions. There was a working class culture that was different from consumer culture, what you'd call popular in France. So we had that in common, even though we were different generations. I was wondering how to make sense or maintain a sense of politics in a situation that was inherently chaotic and apolitical, regretting history. Of course, that's hardly a topic anymore. But it was one of Semiotech's big topics. That's why I thought it was destiny that I should meet you. I was never a Maoist. I only realized later on that in France, I had been a Stalinist. Yeah, well, how do you talk about the past without it seeming like an epitaph? Hence my hatred of the penis, hatred of capitalism. Yeah, but I love Dick, you know? What did you think looking through the book today? I felt that all of it was theory. Even when theory wasn't there, it was so strong. Reading Isata's interview, prisoner in the United States, made me think that while we were supposed to live such a privileged life in our glamorous vacuum, it relies on the fact that 1.3 million people in this country have just been put away. And that millions of people all over the world and in America are paying for this technological paradise. It's very upsetting. But the feeling I had was also strength, being connected to something very important that hasn't disappeared. When I started Semiotext in 1974, we were in the last gasp of Marxism, and I knew the terrorists were right, but I could not condone their actions. That is still the way I feel right now. What happened is that we forgot that capitalism even exists. It has become invisible because there's nothing else to see. When I told Baudrillard about this book, he said the title sounded too old-fashioned. He didn't get the joke. But capitalism hasn't disappeared. I was trying to disappear for years by doing interviews, but capitalism hasn't disappeared. Its repercussions are even more momentous than before, but no one can seem to grasp them. The telephone rings. It's Mark von Schlegel, who has edited sections of the book. Mark, what do you think about the book? I think it's fine. I enjoyed the parts I read. I totally liked it. Yeah, but do you think it's historical or speculative? Probably a bit of both. I think it's hysterical. What do you want it to be? I want it to be beautiful. Mark hangs up. So where should we move on to another topic? I wanted to say something about this direct, immediate tone of voice we publish in Native Agents and how it relates to the entire project. When I was doing a lot of interviews, it was because I wanted theory to become ideas that would have a direct impact, that would be grasped as naturally as you breathe. Conversational theory. Yeah. Interviews was one way of doing it. The other was to surround it with other stuff till it became part of something more fluid and couldn't be isolated. Documents, images, quotes, ideas being part of some kind of movement that takes you from one thing to the next and changes, changes everything about the world. Certain things need to be said over and over in order for anyone to hear them. I was reading an essay by Jill Johnston this afternoon about meeting R.D. Lang. She'd noticed this enormous leap between the divided self that was written in the late 1950s and the politics of experience that came out in 1965 or so. And she wanted to know how that happened. She wrote, I concluded that Lang must have been protecting himself professionally by coming on as the high priest of madness without any direct personal information as to how he got there. And I was determined to ask him why. 
She was writing this in 1972, thinking that total disclosure on the part of everyone is the only way that we can understand why things are the way they are. 30 years later, this is still so radical. Disclosure's gotten mixed up with confession. And confession may be ridiculed, but it's basically condoned because it implies personal guilt, the first step back into the fold, some kind of cheap catharsis. Disclosure, the mere statement of facts, bisects reality into cause, into cause and effect. And this is much more disturbing. But the culture still considers seriousness immune from any kind of disclosure. Lang or any other great man would lose the power of myth if we understood how the myth was constructed. The French avant-garde was looking for things extreme. Capitalism never goes to the extreme. And that's where you can get it. Can you put madness to some use? Hatred of capitalism is real madness. But Jill was crazy. And so were a lot of the people that we publish. But to me, this idea of total disclosure seems incredibly obvious, factual, and benign. Alika Meinhoff's manifesto, that was crazy. She was so sensitive to things we hardly notice anymore. The crippling effects of consumer culture, there she was talking about the masses, and if professional competition, there she was obviously talking about herself and her own world. Career is so ingrained now, we don't even question it. Of course, Meinhoff was mad, but so is Fanny Howe. The madness of truth. To think about anything for very long is delirium. Part two, Severe's second dream. Next morning, Los Angeles, California, 10.45 a.m. In the dream I had last night, I was trying to hide a piece of paper from people who were hounding me. It was several layers thick, like parchment, a piece of text thick with many layers. A thick piece of paper that I was wearing on me, and I was trying to protect it from people who wanted to grab it. But however hard I tried, I could never make it disappear. It was bright red. And then they would always find it. And I had to fend off, I had to fend them off. Then the paper turned into some sort of living material. Not exactly meat or insect life, but made of layers too. And it was attacking me, and I was trying to beat it and take pieces off and get rid of it. But it would always grow back, and it was thick and slimy. I didn't have blood on my hands, but I had this meaty feeling that I was pounding on a piece of meat that wouldn't let itself be torn away. You put this book together. What do you think it's about? What I like about the book is that it feels really seamless, that all the different parts of it are pieces of the same organism. In this sense, Bergeriat's hysteria about the end of politics and Louis Wolfson's numeric prophecies and Michelle's descriptions of the Juan Goth kids of Goth, Juan Goth kids of Copley Square and Anne Rower's druggy memories of Tim Leary's circa 1961 are all part of the same thing. Eileen Miles asks if she's the only person in the room who can't afford to fix her teeth. And Elaine Jacques explains how genocidal skirmishes are structurally inbuilt to global capitalism. Every piece of writing in this book is totally polemical. It's action writing, totally self-aware that it's paradigm. In that sense, all the writing in this book embraces the philosophy of terrorism. At first, I didn't want to do the book because it seemed like a first-class funeral. Semiotext never published any manifestos. Therefore, it's preposterous to think that there could be any kind of ending or conclusion. It was nice this morning working in the garden. Yes, the roses, pruning. In the place where I grew up, there were these two older women living down the road, Claire and her aunt. I always saw them working in the garden. Claire's aunt was very old. She dressed entirely in black, except for a straw hat, which had a black veil. She was like an ancient beekeeper. Well, that's how I pictured what we were doing. Her eyes messed up. It was so peaceful. During World War II, we had this long, narrow garden in the distant suburbs of Paris. We were growing rutabagas, 
It was the only vegetable that was allowed. And every leaf was full of brown bugs that we had never seen before. They'd come along with the German army and were devouring every bit of food we had. But we had six beautiful rabbits. Do you want to hear the whole thing? Yeah. We were fascinated by their teeth. I used to put my finger through the mesh of the cage. They were like lions. They snapped off the finger of the neighbor's little girl. Do you know what became of them? Oh. There was one I liked a lot called Blackie. He was black and velvety to touch, and I thought his twitching nose was full of wisdom. The rabbits were our food reserve. Every bit of them was used. My father skinned them, their flesh turned black again in the sauce my mother made. We knew that Blackie would turn out that way. So did you save him? No, we couldn't. There was nothing else to eat. So one day my parents killed it, but my sister and I refused to touch it. That's a sad story. But so is Nina Zabancevich about the war in Yugoslavia. I think we're approaching a Californiaization of semiotext. The best part of being in LA is when you can enter this kind of suspended kind of time to just go with the emptiness and float through the day. The texts themselves are less important than the mesh effect they create together. It's like what the magazine was doing in New York in the 70s and early 80s. Yeah, it's more like an atmosphere of meaning than any particular meaning, except there was this guerrilla fashion element to it then. Part of reading the magazine was always wondering where you stood in relation to the in crowd. Now it's much more open. That's because there's no more center, no more edge. But this book is like a homing head, finding issues that are urgent in the midst of its diffusion. The end. <laughs>
uh, later. I guess Mexicali Rose came, your interest in that came from Tiny Creatures. But, um, and you, 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 I guess you spoke about it. People were angry because they're like, why is this important? Why are you writing about this? And it's something I've wondered myself because I, I recently reread this essay because I remember loving it like when I first read it eight years ago. And, and I've since spent a lot of time in LA and I still only recognize two names of artists. One was Devendra Benhart, which is not difficult to recognize. Another is Kate Stewart, who's a painter who's recently started showing, but everyone else was like a complete mystery to me. Um, and uh, this text is, it feels like it's become kind of canonical in a way when talking about uh, independent spaces. And and at the same time, I, I think its importance is debatable within, um, I guess, the general historical ecology of independent spaces. And I'm wondering, um, I mean, obviously, I think a big component of it is you writing about it, but... Also, it's like, why why has this become so important? I'm wondering. I mean, because you said you just kind of happened across it. It wasn't that you like looked at the landscape and said, this is the most important space. I'm going to write about <laughs> this, right? But um, it's funny. I wonder if, if one of the reasons it's become so important is that it becomes to a certain degree an allegory of the independent space or a kind of allegory. Yes, of course. It was an allegory. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I'm, I'm a writer, I'm not a real art critic. I don't ever see myself as or pretend to be a real art critic or art historian. I mean, maybe it is the job of the art historian to say this matters, this doesn't matter. But as a writer, your job is just to kind of pick up on whatever interests you. And as you say, I mean, this, the, the story of what happened at Tiny Creatures just seemed kind of allegorical of so many youthful bohemian enterprises and independent spaces, but that just seemed like a great story. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny because it reads like, it reads like a like a piece of uh, fictional journalism, like Joan Didion or something. Yeah. It has that quality as well. That's like one of the reasons that it's so compelling. Um, yeah, and uh, and it's, and it, I, I, another thing I thought was interesting was how you said these kind of things that interest you, um, and I think one of the things that makes them so interesting for us as readers is uh, the way you write about them, which kind of maybe takes it to something, you know, uh, beyond allegory and into something that, in, in, you know, infuses it with a certain meaning and your interest in uh, these I guess, at least in that book, like these kind of collective enterprises. And then culture is almost like this kind of accidental phenomena. It's not something that's uh, necessarily hyper theorized in the beginning, but actually just happens and then kind of flares up. Yeah. Um, is there a question? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to respond to that, except maybe that in the, this writing about the spaces the way that I do, what my character says in the little play about total disclosure and seeing that as a value, I mean, that becomes such an important part of like, you know, I couldn't have told the tiny creature's story unless they wanted their stories to be told. And that included talking about the breakups and the drug addiction and the stolen money and the feuds and the ego fights. And all of that is what makes it such a great and relatable story. Mm. Um, but that very rarely enters the story, you know, the official story of art history. Yes. And so to be able to write in a more literary kind of, you know, um, neo-journalistic way about what really happens in these situations is kind of a great gift mm -hmm. because of course art, art history edits that all out. It's true. Yeah. All the messy stuff just kind of disappears. <laughs> right. um, and, you know, also writing the Kathy Acker biography, I was very lucky that I wanted to write that book 20 years before I wrote it. I wanted to write it right after she died. And so I ran off down to San Diego and I talked to Martha Rosler and all the key San Diego people who had been in Kathy's early 20s right after she died. 
And, you know, so they still hated her. You know, they still remembered all the feuds and all the factions and all the texture of daily life stuff. And they didn't even particularly think I was really going to write the book. Um, so I have hours and hours of tape of those people talking in 1998 about, you know, their not then so distant memories of Kathy. And that's completely different from what they would have said if I'd gone back in 2014. It would have all been very elegaic and kind of more a memory of their youth than a memory of like their particular youth. Amazing. Um, it seems we have a couple questions on cards. Would you like, yeah. yeah? Would you like to read them or do you, I read them and you respond or I guess you're, you listen, you can hear me. Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay. So can you develop more on the importance and political agency of exposing writing about tiny creatures. Um, and even yourself through I Love Dick, you becoming exposed, exposing yourself. Okay. Can I have a quick look? Um. Oh, yeah. This is about exposure, total exposure. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking the same thing in 2001 when Silver and I did this little dialogue, the play that we just read, this idea about disclosure being something so radical. Um, and I learned that, where did I learn that from? From Eileen Miles, from reading Eileen's work. And where did Eileen learn it from? She learned it from reading Jill Johnston. There's this fantastic show now in Bergen, maybe some of you have seen it, that um, Axel Bader has organized um, of Jill Johnston's early work. Are you all, do, are you, do you all know who Jill Johnston was? She was this incredible critic, um, writing as early as like 1960, 1962. She was one of the um, early Village Voice critics and she wrote a dance column. She was trained as a dancer. Um, but her column turned into this kind of following her life. You know, she was like a lesbian activist and she was also taking a lot of speed at the time. And um, she had to turn her column every week and she would like write these incredible three or four or 5,000 word rants that were about the dance and art that she was seeing, but also about who was there and what she was wearing and who she's thinking and feeling. I mean, it became this kind of panoramic view of what it was like to be alive and a participant with the art at that moment. I mean, it was a total report. And wow, that just became such a paradigm for me of what any kind of criticism should be. Gary Indiana was a great practitioner of that form as well. And Semiotex just published his a, a collection of his columns, Vile Days, from the Village Voice from the 1980s, which are like the truest and most definitive history of, um, of what the East Village art world was, much more so than any more kind of formal art writing at the time. And, you know, Gary would wrote, write these long rants, you know, about his life. And the very last paragraph, maybe, he'd talk about the show. And everything else leading up to it was, like, about what was happening around the show. Um, Bruce Hanley, the critic, picked up on that. And Bruce Hanley did this incredible labor. None of these existed in, like, in electronic format. And the voice was never digitized. So... After the election of Trump, Bruce Hanley was so depressed and wondering what he could do to feel a spirit of like life and cleansing himself. He went to the library at UCLA where they had hard copies of Gary's columns and he spent weeks typing Gary's columns into the computer and that became the manuscript that we published. So it's, it's like this kind of transmission from one writer to another now over decades and decades and generations. It's amazing. I have to pick that up. Um, your account of tiny creatures is so precise, how they met, how they did um, how they did arts and crafts uh, together, how it developed. Did you talk with people after the fact or at the time? How did your reconstruction of the gallery's story change the people involved after the fact? Yeah, 
Um, in Tiny Creatures, it was all after the fact, but it wasn't that much longer. It was like a year or two, and I knew everybody, and they were all around and available. And um, so, yes, I was talking to everybody after the fact. Um, Mexicali Rose, um, I wasn't such a participant, but I was kind of buzzing in and out while it still existed. And the third space I read about lost properties, I also visited and participated a little bit while it was still going before it became defunct. Um, yeah, so I wrote about it while it still existed and then it folded. Um, I guess that's a, that's a nice segue into the last question, which will actually segue really nicely into the rest of the day. But um, I loved your quote, not everything needs to be permanent to be important. Um, I love that as well. Uh, but does this pen, uh, does this perpetrate the romantic myth of the short-lived artist live fast, die young? How does anyone know what's permanent or important when it's happening? What's lost when we emphasize being historically significant? Can I have a look, please? Thanks. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, live fast, die young. I don't, <laughs> what's the opposite? You know, the opposite of transience is that everything is permanent. And I mean, I'm sure all of you as, as, as curators and, you know, organizers of spaces have had experience with these really deadly spaces that go on year after year and like decades after they're culturally relevant. You know, they just perpetuate themselves for no particular reason so that people can keep having a nonprofit job. And that's a kind of living death. I mean, artist space in New York had become that. You know, it was like this gaping 3,000 square foot tomb until Richard Burke, uh, until Richard Burkett and, and Stefan came and took it over in, um, when they did in 2010. So, I mean, not everything has to last forever. And I guess people only decide after the fact what's historically important. And sometimes people go searching for things years later. I mean, like Axel digging up Jill's stuff. There's this, this zine that's hanging on the walls at the Bergen Kunst Hall um, that was made by Les Levine. I never knew about it. And it was so fascinating. Axel dug it up all these years later. I didn't even know it existed. And it was made, I don't know, in the early 70s. And that was a period that I was writing about in the Acker biography. But the combination of people in Les Levine's scene made me think about the period in a whole different way. Like, oh, I didn't know that X knew Y or that they were in the same room together. So it's like, new pieces of history are constantly being brought in to the movie and it changes how we see the movie. So I think we're constantly revisioning history according to, you know, with there's no definitive history ever. There's no what? No definitive history ever. Yeah. Um, that's totally true. Um, it seems that we've basically run out of time, uh, but uh, I just wanted to thank you again so much for coming and talking with us today and squeezing us in your really busy schedule and um, and asking some really good questions and making some excellent points regarding especially transience and permanence. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay, so there's coffee up at the front. Uh, we're gonna move now into our first panel of the day. Um, as, uh, and thank you again, Chris Kraus. Uh, so as, uh, as Rhea already mentioned a bit, our format for the day is going to have three, we're going to focus now on kind of voice and communication of institutions. But as Rhea has mentioned, each of these kind of panel discussions is, is in some way they're interchangeable or there's an arbitrariness to why certain people are on certain panels because every institution in the room could answer to all of these questions in very interesting ways. Um, so hopefully this is more like a continuation of the discussions that we started yesterday and flowing into the afternoon's panel and the end of the day's workshop and discussion. So 
Uh, today, we have with us three institutions we have and i'll just briefly introduce them all of you have their biographies in the brochure so you can look for more information and they'll present themselves as well um i would once again encourage everyone please take some question uh, sheets and ask questions. This is a moment to really be direct and also understand the workings of these institutions in a in a very straightforward way. Um, so we have three institutions. We have Louise Daney, who is represented here by artist and writer Ina Hagen and artist and filmmaker Daisuke Kusugi. Uh, they're based here in Oslo and we'll speak about their practice. Uh, then we have the Artists Institute, represented here by its founder, Anthony Huberman, um, which is in New York, continues to exist, but represented here by its originally original founding director. And then finally, we have Kunsthalle Lisbon, uh, which was founded in 2009 in Lisbon and is here represented by Joao Moral and Luis Silva, who uh, founded the space as well. And so again, the focus of our panel is what we're calling institutional voices, communication, press text, design, appearance. I will say um, one of the other hats I wear is as a graphic designer. So I, I, did, I did ask to be the one uh, having this discussion in particular. So hopefully we can get into some interesting conversations. So um, I would love to ask Ina and Daisuke to come up and begin. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Ina Hagen. Um, this is my collaborator, partner, Daisuke Kosugi. We run um, a space here in Oslo called Louis Sani. I'm going to just very briefly like introduce you to the space and the particularities of it to give you a sense of, of what we are. Um, so we're both practicing artists, uh, which is an important point to us. We don't necessarily in, um, define our space as an institution as of yet, but I guess it's hard, these like... Um, terms are slippery. Um, we are located in the west side of Oslo um, and we we run our space from our home. It is um, a storefront uh, with direct street, street access and, and uh, mirror foiled windows with a sliding door that leads you into our apartment where we live. Um, the space is also one that we use as a studio once there's nothing really um, going on as, as Louis Denis. Um, we do this um, because hosting and blurring the boundary between the private and the public is kind of a core of how we thought about starting the space and how we run the space. And I'm going to get back to this a little bit. But, um, uh, but also when we collaborate with artists, when we collaborate with institutions, when we when we have practitioners come in and work with us, they live with us, we cook together, we uh, share aspects of our lives together, which is also a central part of how um, we work. And the name Louis Denis comes from um, or is taken from the the name of the housemaid and, and lifelong companion of the 20th century designer and architect Eileen Gray. Um, and so uh, this kind of highlights as well the, the quality of the space that we try to uh, create in, in, our, in our home. Um, so to say a little bit on topic about the design strategy, we do everything ourselves. We don't necessarily work with designers unless um, we have specific collaborator, collaborators. So we've, we have collaborated with a design practice called Hardworking Good Looking, which is a Manila, Brooklyn-based um, design company. And then they did um, something for us. But um, all in all, we keep a very fluid strategy. We've never had the intention to create one singular identity for Louis Denis. It's never had like a visual identity that's very clearly um, formulated, but rather one that adapts to our collaborators. So a core to the practice that we do is collaborating with other institutions, um, with artist practices that are uh, collective, collaborative, 
And in doing that, we adopt also the, the communication and design strategies of the spaces that we work with. So one of our very early collaborators is a, a, um, a US-based uh, artist-run nonprofit space called Institute for New Cognitive Action, which was in Detroit and Seattle for a while. And they have a very strong um, statement with their design and they have a very strong design presence and so in our um, ongoing series with them we adopt their their strategy then we have other examples like this one that you're seeing here is a 10 week long residency that we did, that we did with the partially LA based artist Norwegian artist Hanna Mjølsnes uh, coupled with a Norwegian artist called Miriam Hansen um, that was that is an experiential kind of long-term engagement with specific plants um, that uh, are to be found in a, or are described in a in a pre-Christian poem called the Nine Nine Herbs Charm. And so, for this specific project, we um, the kind of long-term meeting with these plants and the artist was at the core of the project. So we developed. Um, an Airbnb um, kind of line to this project or access where people could come and live in uh, the flat together with the artists, which was also a way of kind of co-founding the residency uh, or like co-funding the residency um, and provided a completely different like channel for communicating the project, but also a completely different like visual appearance of the project and and uh, a different audience uh, for then for instance the Inca collaborations um, so in general I could say that we focus very much on project by project mediation strategies and ideas about which audiences that we want to reach so again um, in line with trying to to create and focus on the personal meeting within a private space, so like meetings between people first, we uh, focus on on trying to um, reach very specific um, audience groups for each individual project. And Daisuke is going to talk a little bit more about about that after me. But just to kind of highlight uh, or underline that um, that we work very consciously with the kind of uh, kind of audiences we try to reach, um, and um, just very briefly on documentation because we generally um, document but don't distribute unless it's kind of within the logic of the work that we're working with. So, like with this project in particular. Nine Herbs Charm was one that circulated online through Airbnb, through like a continuous um, website that was created by the artists and through their uh, Instagram, feed, Instagram feeds and our own. It is one that exists with a lot of images online, but generally we don't um, publish uh, a lot of documentation because we're working to create kind of spaces for uh, for more protected conversations. So like a lot of our programming is discursive, workshop-based, conversation-based programming. So we do um, think very consciously about how to protect that space as much as we can. Uh, so I'm gonna let it make it no, higher. Fine. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we think about communication. Um, we rather want to have conversation uh, than communication. So we have uh, we don't have so much press text or like uh, the information that we try to give. Uh, more or less, we ask them to come and spend time with us because that we uh, enjoy most doing art. Uh, this is a maybe like a, a fundamental point why we want to open this space is being artists most pr privileged being artists is spend studio conversation with fellow artists when something is 
really interesting and and the how to say like mumbling in your head but you don't know what it's going to be or you have some conflict with format or content or how it can go through uh, the process and that moment the conversation mode of conversation happen is completely different from how we can have a conversation with artist talk or this kind of presentation uh, what i understand is that when we have artist talk post finishing the art artwork is most of the conversation go to so why did you make this uh, what why um what kind of logic make how um how to say how do you legitimize your decision making and we are not really interested in that uh, like good solution i'm not so interested in the that quality of art uh, but when we talk about working progress uh, what we what it happened is that everyone everyone pour their knowledge and experience and see what can be and that kind of conversation is not one one directional the people who can give back the feedback also almost talk their practice through the the other people's practice and that's what we really want to host and but that have a physical um and practical limitation and uh, so that's why we have uh the group critique session which is more like sem fabric that we invite certain people specifically and we found that to maintain this intimacy because working in process uh, talking about working in process is really insecure and fragile uh we have to cut out certain public eye and feel like it's private so we found out the maximum amount of people that we can communicate in that or have a conversation in that at the same time it's maybe 12 at the same time which is not really idealistic for institutional let's say like a public institutional form but in the end we are at this run space no one asks us to do anything so <laughs> that's what we do and uh, so our space uh reflect this kind of way of thinking and it asks uh, audience or participant commitment of time and also um yeah their effort to coming back and be get to know us they can't just stand on the wall and just observe they have to be person in the space and i think that's uh, important value that we try to protect in our space thank you Um, thank you. I am here to give a short introduction to this place. I love this this um, idea of, of of asking us to choose just one image um, to represent what these institutions are. And for me, I actually have given a lecture about the Artist Institute that actually has only just used this single image the entire time. For me, I, I found this image maybe about 10 years ago on Craigslist on the online kind of classified ad. Um, and it just immediately spoke ex pretty much exactly. For me, this image contains in it, it says something about the kind of place that might be behind that door. That was, that was exactly what I was looking for at, at the time. It says something about it's not really a shop. It's not really a, you know, it doesn't have a big storefront window. It's like you can't, it doesn't really, wouldn't really be functional as a gallery. It's not really an office either. Um, it, 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 it's kind of domestic, except it's on the street level like that. Um, it's, it's kind of street level, but it's also a basement. There's a couple feet underground. Um, and it, 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 so it has this strange public private thing where it seems like it's, you know, it's it's available. It's right on the street, but it's kind of a few steps. You know, you have to kind of make a decision to decide to enter the door. Um, so there's a kind of self-selecting thick thing about that. Um, and it, it just, I guess, in general, it looks like a place where people are spending time. Um, people are 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 spending time with each other, spending time with ideas, um, kind of uh, gathering there rather than just kind of stopping in and 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 shopping there, for example. Um, and 
you know, for me, maybe the word that that fits that all all those characteristics together is a word that I was thinking a lot about at the time, which is this simple word institute. Um, and an institute, I think, contains a couple different things inside of it and that I was interested in. Um, I guess this project is maybe the least independent project that we've heard so far because this all came about um, in conversation with and in partnership with the biggest public university in the United States, um, City University of New York. Um, Hunter College was the, the kind of umbrella organization that made all this thing possible. And so within the context of thinking about um, an academic setting and a university setting and also uh, an art an art space and a, a curatorial space and a, a place that tries to kind of create a public interface with for art objects and an audience, I was interested in how this word institute exists in both of those arenas and refers to different things in the sense that in the art world, uh, an institute, a P, that word pops up when you talk about a London ICA or Philadelphia ICA or Boston ICA, an Institute of Contemporary Art, which basically refers to a public space for exhibitions and events. In the academic context, however, an institute, that word is also very much um, in use in that context, but refers to something completely different, um, refers to something a lot more private, refers to something that usually happens on the you know 10th floor of some academic building or the Institute for the Study of XYZ. Uh, and it's not really a classroom, it's really a, a kind of place where a community of people who all share a, an affinity or all share a, a overlapping research interests, you know, gather. Uh, and and sh and share their research and come together on an, on a kind of long term committed to a single topic over the course of a long period of time, um, and so this kind of I, I was interested in bringing those two institutes together, um, and this somehow this image di did that for me. It's both you know public. It's an ICA in the sense that it's a I, it's hilarious to talk about this as an ICA, but um, it's it's uh, it, it has the kind of ability to to be. Uh, public. It was located in on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, so it was very much inserted within a neighborhood of of kind of ga gallery going passersby. So it public, very public, a lot more public than the tenth floor of Hunter College's 68th Street building. Um, but also, of course, it also was a little bit private look feeling. It had a sense of it being. Um, it, it being uh, a, a, a research institute in, in, in that sense. Um, the way that it operated was very simple. It, um, um, the idea, again, was to try to, in the context of New York at the time, so this, around 2009 is when this whole thing kind of began. It opened to the public in 2010. And, um, you know, the idea for me was, was fairly straightforward, especially New York suffers, I think all of us are connected to this, but there's this kind of conveyor belt, you know, um, uh, incredibly fast consumption pro process of constantly moving on to the next artist and the next project and the next thing and this kind of voracious appetite of constantly wanting to do more and, and, and find the next new thing. And I just wanted to spend more time with less things. Um, and wanted to create a space where the things were, as we heard a little bit earlier, a little bit quieter. Um, and and so I, the idea was just to divide the year into two seasons, I called them, um, and dedicate each one to a single artist. Um, and the space, I don't have a picture here, but the space was very small um, inside. I mean, as you can kind of guess. Uh, and And because of its scale, it, it, it was completely possible for it to actually just be fine by showing one work at a time. So that's what we did. It was, it was a six month long season around one artist and every month or so or month and a half we would change and it was always just one artwork at a time. So you'd walk in in this basement and there would be one drawing by Rosemary Trockel on the wall or one sculpture by Jimmy Durham sitting there. And and so it created this strange thing around what what um, yeah, it was it was an interesting um, uh, experience. And so it had this sense of on one hand, yes, on one hand, it was discursive. It was about gathering an intellectual uh, kind of creating a collective conversation around one figure for six months. But it also was very much prioritizing the actual physical art object. It wasn't just a 
a, a workshop, right? There was an actual artwork there that was to, that not only was to be taken seriously, it was the only thing in the room. So it was given an even heightened importance of this kind of physical thing in the room to be to be contended with. So it was it would it, it, it kind of spoke to this notion of being a kind of in-depth um, time spent with one figure. Um, and um, and so it was this kind of institute for a single artist, you know, uh, an artist's institute. Um, that we're showing one, one, one work at a time. And it began, each season kind of began the way I always thought about it, we began with a hypothesis. It would just say, I hypothesize that today we should be thinking about, you know, Jimmy Durham. Um, and we're going to spend the next six months kind of testing that hypothesis and seeing as, as, as th does that, does this work mobilize and kind of expand outwards to a rich territory of a wider range or other, other artists, other voices, other cr bridges to other fields? Like are the terms and words and questions that are inherent in this particular artist's work, you know, how much, what, what are its legs? Kind of where does it go? And how can that mobilize and stimulate a broader conversation with lots of other people? And so each of these single works um, was accompanied sometimes by other works, by other artists for short periods of times, but lots of events and, and screenings and discussions and, and, and as a way to kind of take the single artist as a point of departure to explore, um, to create, again, a kind of collective uh, conversation around, around their work and their, and their ideas. And so we did um, these six month long seasons with, I mentioned Jimmy Durham, Rosemary Trockel, Heim Steinbach, Joe Baer, Thomas Byerley, um, artists of that um, of that type. So um, to say a few words about um, the topic uh, here um, uh, around communication. Um, the communication and and uh, was essentially related to um, I wanted to create a, a they, they felt like there needed to be a relationship between what this image looks like and what the what it should sound like. Um, what would what would that if this is a person, what, what would that person sound like somehow? And it felt to me like there was something very connected to scale, that there was a there was a scale happening here. It's a, it's it's a, it's an institution that's about a single artist showing a single work in a really small room. And that had to do, and therefore the, the the way it should be written about felt like it should be addressing itself as if as if the the the, the institution were addressing itself to a single person. So rather than a kind of e flux style, dear world, you know, we are proud to present a season with blah blah blah. It was like, dear Chris, let me tell you about Heim Steinbach. Um, and it was it was written in this in that way. It was written in this form. All of the language, you know, to call them press releases was a bit absurd because, um, again, there's not really shows happening here. It was not really an exhibition space. Um, it was more of a, um, it was more of a kind of six month long story uh, that was unwinding and unraveling over time uh, with a narr well, that was narrated. I kind of played the function of the narrator, telling an audience like chapter by chapter, you know, the, the various. Um, um, words that were entering into the conversation in this accumulative way. Uh, and so it was written as a, so I played this, 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 um, the, the role of, uh, of the narrator and all of the emails and that we printed brochures that were available um, for each, every, every, actually every single event, I wrote a, a chapter of the story. So it wasn't like there was just one text for the whole six month season around Rosemary Chalk, but every single lecture and every single event had its own chapter that I wrote about it. Um, and those would be um, always available. And the, in terms of the graphic identity, the, 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 the website was, you know, the, it was developed by a graphic design uh, duo called uh, Dexter Sinister. David Reinfurt and Stuart Bailey um, were the ones who worked on the, the, the graphic system. And it was very simple. The graphic system essentially understood that the graphic identity was this narrator's voice basically like the graphic identity was the language was the storytelling and so there were no images on this website the the website was just this story being told in in episodes uh and every time you would go it would it would just what you would see on the screen would be this kind of next you know it would start it would always start by you know today we should be thinking about 
whatever artist was was that season and then the next page would 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 be the uh, presentation of the next um whatever the whatever chapter was going on at that particular time and so it was written um in that way and and uh and, and the graphic identity was built around 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 language and in in that way so maybe we'll get on a bunch of these a bunch of this when we have a conversation but that's a general overview everyone uh, uh, we'd like to start thanking Chris, Rhea and Fran for the invitation and also then Rodrigo for the artwork uh, I'm going to start by reading a statement that we released in the beginning of the year Kunsal Lisbon is celebrating its 10th anniversary in 2019 we, we opened to the public on July 3rd 2009 and since then we have presented more than 40 exhibitions and published, and have published 14 volumes. We collaborate with numerous local and inter international institutions and develop continuous reflection in institutional knowledge and practice on the field of contemporary art. It was an incredible decade. We decided to celebrate the occasion not by organizing a party of epic proportions or by writing a manifesto on how difficult it is to manage a small contemporary art institution. We decide to celebrate by simply disappearing from the cultural landscape of the city, stopping to reflect. The Lisbon that was favorable to the appearance of Kunsal Lisbon in 2009 has very little, very little in common with the gentrified and touristified Lisbon of 2019. It would hardly be possible to start today as we did in 2009. We want to reflect on the responsibility that we have in this process, and we also want to re reflect on the critical role that we can have in thinking of other ways of imagining the position that contemporary art occupies under these circumstances. For international partners, for like-minded institutions, we'll, have, we'll take over the space, we'll leave vacant not only the space, but also our production and communication infrastructure, our resources, and even our online presence. It will be as if each of these four institutions open a pop-up version of themselves in Lisbon over a period of time. They will have to negotiate with, with and interact with a context that is not their own, but for which they will have to work publicly. Kunstal Lisbon, will be the host that is so radical, it gives everything it has to his guests, disappearing in the process. The notion of, of, of hospitality has always been one of central pillars of our institutional thinking. And for the 10th anniversary, we want to take it to the extreme. At the same time, we also want to investigate temporary disappearance as a way of reflecting on the cultural fabric of the city like Lisbon at the present time. We have no idea what the outcome of this whole process will be. Kunsal Lisbon will most likely return in 2020. Well, it, it is a lie um, because here we are. Uh, and despite, uh, and besides this statement, which was our uh, only uh, public activity this year, we are here presenting uh, Kunsthal Lisbon. So it's really interesting uh, that you put us in a panel about voice, institutional voice, when we actually uh, committed to institutional silence this year. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's really interesting uh, for us as a way of celebrating our anniversary to withdraw, to go silent, and to let others speak in our behalf. And we've invited four institutions to do that. And Fernanda and Pivo were the first, and will continue uh, throughout the year. Um, but before becoming silent, as as a result of, of of many things that has happened to the institution and to the context in which the institution uh, exists, we had a voice, uh, and we had a, what we think is a very loud voice, and we said many things, or rather than saying many things, 
we were asking several questions and we would like to share those questions, uh, our voice with you. And when we started back in 2009, one of the first questions we were really interested in and actually led to the creation of this institution was to think, what is an institution? Uh, what's at the core of instituting? Uh, and we've all discussed uh, language and power yesterday and how language creates realities. So the act of naming was very important to us because a Kunsthalle and a Kunsthalle Lissabon as a name, as a marker, as a brand, if you will, um, as an identity, uh, automatically triggers a series of expectations in our audience. And we wanted to play with those expectations in order to ask that question. Uh, are we an institution? Despite having a terrible space, just being two people, no budget, but would you consider a world in which we could become or could be an institution? And that kept us busy for many, many years. Um, we were playing with the idea of the hoax faking something into existence, faking ourselves into existence. And it's, it's, really, it's really curious that this very important conceptual godmother kept us company. Uh, and it was Tess McGill from the film, from the movie uh, Working Girl from Mike Nichols from, from, from the 80s. Yeah, she's in the cover. Of the she's, first she's in the cover of the first publication. We quote her in the first publication. And she had this very important line for us in the movie where she says, uh, if you want to be taken serious, you got to have serious hair. So if we wanted to be taken serious as an institution, we got to have a very important name. Um, and along the way, that question of what is an institution um, materialized in many ways. The image, of course, was very important. And from the beginning, uh, we were very interested in how we presented the institution to the outside world. And the image is very important. And we cheated. This is not an image. This is a video. Um, but as part of the discussion of trying to think of institutions as fundamentally subjective and social constructions, uh, our image tried to reflect that. And our designer who, understand, who understood the project really, really well, decided what if instead of having one stable image, every year I create a new logo for the institution. I create a completely different uh, visual identity for the institution. So that way people will never be able to fix it, to pinpoint it to one specific visual identity. And, and this At is this what- At this point, yeah, you, you use the, the hashtag as, as the name. So this is, the, yeah, this is a really interesting yeah. one because we went a bit further down <laughs> that road and we changed the name. Uh, the name, which was Kunstal Lissabon, was changed during that year to hashtag Kunstal Lissabon. Uh, it was when hashtags were becoming really cool. So we wanted to play with people's expectations on that as well. This one, for instance, the designer wanted to go even more extreme again. And he, he thought, that, what if having one logo for the year, every time you do something, every time you present a show, you publish a book, you do a talk, I'll grab a free font and I'll write uh, a logo with it and then you'll use it. So during that year, we had like, I don't know, 20 okay. different logos. It was a nightmare. And uh, he regrets it, of course. He regrets <laughs> giving us this idea because that means every year he has to come up with a new identity for us. This year, he's on a hiatus, of course. Um, but again, this question, this voice uh, slowly transitioned into a voice that asked the question, uh, what modes, what institutional formats can we imagine as a community? Uh, we went from asking what is an institution to what kind of institution can we imagine and produce? Um, and, 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 and for us, it was really important to think the institution through a series of categories uh, that were there from the beginning, but hadn't been kind of fleshed out. And those were, for instance, generosity, sociability, and solidarity. And the institution is a machine, if you will, that operates on these uh, uh, fuel, if you want, and what it produces uh, is, is for us is something that is very interesting, is an idea of a relationship that can be coined as friendship. So what Kunsthal Lissabon produces is friendship towards the audience, towards the artist, and towards everyone involved. And of course, friendship is not necessarily or publicly visible. So um, the public output is how that friendship, that relationship is made visible. 
Uh, and for us, this, the, the solo show is very important and we commit to the format of the solo show because it allows us to establish a very long lasting, long-term relationship with the artist. That is productive, of course, but most of the times it isn't. We spend time together. Uh, we, you know, we have meals together, we have dinner together, we drink together, we discuss the world together. And from all that time spent together, slowly a project starts emerging. So a solo project for us is, of course, it's this nexus where, you know, uh, individual subjectivity, the artist point of view is made visible. But this relationship also comes into play. Uh, and, and we've been dealing with that, um, again, as a question for the past years as well. And, Until and, and for having the time for that, we only do four, four shows a year. We're slow. We enjoy yeah. being slow. We don't like to overproduce. Uh, because it gives us the time to really commit to each project. It really gives us time to commit to each person. Um, and throughout all this, um, Lisbon changed. Um, Lisbon, as, as, as Juan read in the statement, went from being, you know, uh, the capital of a city that struggled uh, throughout the financial crisis, and, and you know the stories of Southern European countries during the crisis, to this uh, really cool uh, city that everyone wants to live in. Um, gentrification, touristification, coolification uh, have been kind of running loose in the city and in the country as a political program. It, it's this very um, explicit collaboration between political power and capitalism as, 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 as a vision for the country and for the city. And, and we don't really know how to respond to that. Um, we feel that we have responsibilities towards some of these processes, of course. As a small-scale institution, those responsibilities are minimum, uh, but, but still they're there. You know, I remember 10 years ago, we would be on, on, on a seminar like this and we'd say, we're, com we're coming from Lisbon, people would just shrug. If we now say we're coming from Lisbon, people, oh my God, you have the best city in the world. So these processes have changed how the local community, the local artistic community relate to the city and how the city in turn relates to us. And since we're celebrating 10 years, um, we decided to step back. We decided to stop, to think our role within this new uh, context, how we can respond to it, uh, if we're able to respond to it at all, and to be silent. Uh, and to be silent as a way of thinking. And because, of course, just being silent isn't enough. We thought that it would be interesting to celebrate by inviting other people to speak through us. Um, all these four institutions, which are um, Pivo from Sao Paulo, Cura from Rome, and then Salts from Basel, and then we finish with AICA Philadelphia well, from, uh, from Philadelphia, they're going to have to negotiate and deal with the local audience. They're going to, they have been opening and they will open pop-up versions of themselves in Lisbon. Uh, and, and the outcome is different depending on the institution, depending on the goals, uh, depending on many things. We give them the keys to the space. We give them our budget. We give them our infrastructure production and we give them our online presence. So everything is for them to do as they please. Um, we're just in the background making sure that everything happens according to what they need. Um, and we don't know the outcome of that. We're taking that time also to think what will the next, hopefully, 10 years of Kunsthal Lissabon will be. And that can be many, many things. We can just disappear stop. and stop and decide that we're not able to relate to the city as the city is right now and call it the end. Uh, we can relocate. We can move elsewhere, which is a form of, again, deciding that we don't want to engage with that specific situation, but we could move to another place. We can change our name. You know, when we named it Kunstala Lissabon, it wasn't naive, of course. So the power of language is, you know, the power of language. So maybe rebranding can be an interesting way of making a claim about the situation and about how we wish to engage in the future with our local context. And now it's just after. And just stop. the future is 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 unclear. Most clear as we learn, but we will see. Thank you.
We need one more. Do you want this? Take it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Come on, let's switch up the hosting. No, 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 no. Switch up the format. <laughs> I think one more. Do, do, I, I can take. A, I can take a wireless. Yeah, yeah, no, no, just share. Do we share? Another share. Okay. No. Well, don't leave one in the audience. <laughs> okay, so while we're setting up, just again, I'd love to encourage everyone to write down a question. Everyone must have at least one question for somebody here. Okay. I have one. Now we have two. You can do I have a lot of questions. Um, it's a really interesting juxtaposition as well of positions, um, because I think that in talking about communication, oh, there's some questions already. Um, what's What occurs to me off the bat is, um, Luis and Joao, you made the interesting statement, you talked about language and power. And the question also that came up with uh, Ina and Daisuke about uh, communication versus conversation. Um, but what occurs to me also is that uh, both of those are about the, let's say, the manifest content of what's being communicated. And what we're actually talking about perhaps in this panel, but more generally, is a kind of mode, a modality of how you communicate, whether I'm whispering or whether I'm speaking loudly or whether I'm kind of uh, doing something else entirely. So it's about the things that are on the side, as it were, um, what I wanted to ask about in all three of your cases is if you can just speak to the relationship. So, and all three of the, the institutions have talked about a particular relationship between yourself and, let's say, an artist or artists uh, in, a, in a particular form. I'm curious if you can talk about the specific relationship between how you relate to an artist and how you kind of try to communicate or how you try to, what the mode is in going outward and talking about that, or whether there's more of an institutional mode that is regardless of that relationship. Um, oh, sorry. I guess in, in, in my case, it was, um, it was re re the latter. Um, <laughs> It was um, r regardless. I mean, it was. I guess another. I guess the word that I used, rather than conversation or communication, was was narration. And um, I guess that would be another word to throw in there in terms of how an institution um, um, could 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 tell someone about what is going on. Can can narrate uh, um, what an artist was doing what other people were saying about what an artist was doing um, and that there would be this kind of strange third person who would kind of be the, the glue that would that would bring together you know here's what this artist is doing and here's what the work is is doing here's this poet that that said something about it and here's something that an audience member said about the poet saying something you know and here's this kind of narrator who's trying to kind of bring it all together and sh share it as a as a as a unit and so I guess that was this kind of I felt that there was a way to have a, a kind of continuous steadiness around the, the the narration of it so that the content could be as diverse and contradictory and 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 you know as, you know divert you know kind of wide ranging as possible and go in lots of different directions, but find a way to, that there was still, it wasn't just chaos and throwing darts at stuff, you know, that it all somehow was able to be brought together. Um, yeah, so um, 
in writing for Louis Sunny or kind of through Louis Sunny, I guess, um, an initial an initial place that, that came from a thing that became really useful and a starting point uh, to think about kind of pro projecting outwards, I guess, uh, was through the idea of this historic figure kind of embodied by a space. So like the apartment somehow being the manifestation of this historic figure in the present um, somehow and, and kind of writing from that voice of, of a fictionalized character perhaps, but still very close to our, um, our lives being in this space every day living there like that space is full of us in our our you know ev everyday kind of uh, kind of life and then in in trying to use that perspective or like projection um in meeting with um with the artists that we work with so that there's like a coherency between the kind of conversations that we have with the artists that we work with over a long period of time and the kind of intimate conversations that can happen in the space and the development of text with them very closely, um, but kind of written through this, this, uh, this fictionalized person in a way. Um, and so my, I mean, uh, Louis Ni being in existence since 2016 it, it's not a lot of time but it is enough time to have kind of tried to experiment with different routes or like there we've always tried to keep an openness to to experiment with the voice that comes out through the text production in meeting with the individual artists that we work with um but of course somehow uh, it gains I think or has gained a, a particular tone perhaps of voice which is an address I think mainly to a close circuit of, of people even though that circuit has continuously grown like our our like the people who get these invitations and read these texts that we produce for an exhibition or or the the text that is spoken in a seminar or a workshop or whatever it is, uh, of course, continuously grows, but there's still, I don't know. I, I struggle, I think, personally to also fully um, imagine what that body of people are. So I think in writing for, for Louis Denis, there's still very much like this relationship inside of the living room that, that kind of vibrates in, in there. Yeah. Um, it, when we were preparing uh, the presentation, we, we, and we were thinking about this notion of the voice and how the voice is, you know, conscious. I'm aware that I'm speaking and how I'm speaking, my tone, everything. And we thought of, you know, instead of thinking in terms of institutional voice, think about body language which is much more uh, intuitive and we're not as aware of it as we are of our voice. And I think when Kunsthalle Lissabon engages with the outside world, when it presents itself, it is more a matter of body language than voice. It is not conscious. Um, you know, it is non-hierarchical, of course, and it's very close and intimate, uh, but it's not explicit because you couldn't make it explicit. Even the way we engage with the artists, um, you know, as a small scale institution who commissions new projects, who produces new projects, um, there's a lot of going back and forth. There's site visits, there's, you know, research into production, there's, you know, research into what our budget allows us to do versus what the artist actually wants. And all these things have to be negotiated in a specific way. Um, and that, of course, is, is, is done in a very informal way. Like, since day one, we've said that we would try to avoid uh, writing agreements or asking artists to sign agreements. Uh, until the moment, it, it wasn't possible. And so far, after 10 years, we haven't written a single agreement. Everything has been agreed verbally or, you know, in, in, in a very informal way. So that kind of relationship that we establish 
um, is established not only with the artists but with everyone. Um, our space, uh, it's a ground, well, a, a ground floor and the basement, and the ground floor is the office uh, and the library. So people the audience, visitors have to come through the office to see the show. So they, they come across us, they see us working, they see the actual inner workings of the institution. And if they want to say something, of course they can. And most of the time they do, which is a nightmare because sometimes we don't get any work done. Um, but there's this sense of, you know, opening up and showing how the institution works. Um, and again, this is more of a body language issue than a voice. That's interesting. Yeah, the, the, I like that differentiation. I have to think more about that. <laughs> um, but I, I want to then, I want to also talk in a way, we're talking here about m mostly about communication in the sense of how do you, how do you speak to people who might be coming to an uh, event or an exhibition or not. But I also wanted to bring up the question of uh, documentation of how do you approach um, how do you approach collecting uh, or uh, distributing information about the things you've done after the fact because each of you have an extremely specific kind of stance on that and uh, and yeah so I'd like to ask that question yeah, why don't you go back around the other way? Since, since the beginning, documentation for us for us was really important, especially because when it started, we didn't know for how long we'll be there. So it was like the only thing that we can remain that can remain from that 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 period. Because in the beginning, consult started like in the real in the building in the mid, in the um, the main avenue at at it Lisbon. It was completely it was kind of a squatted place, but we have it for free for so no water, no electricity. You have to pay. So it was also this idea of community because it was a huge building. With more than 40, 40 artist studios, three different artist rent spaces, so all the all the, those those all these ideas of belonging and all this idea of be, building something together that was, as we said in the in the presentation, was, was possible at that time, because no no one cared about buildings at the time in Lisbon, no one cared about the real the real estate, so it was in a way it was easier to start like that. Uh, so documentation was really important since the beginning. And since the beginning, we started to, to work with the photographer that documented everything and that we put in the book since, since the beginning. So, so since the beginning, we have the, the, this idea of performing the institutional, that is the, the series of books we do, a, year, a, a yearly book that kind of present the exhibitions we do during that year, and also bringing the voice of the, the artist to that publications in the second, the, First five years, we did the, some conversations with the artist called um, "Words Don't Come, Words Don't Come Easy." So, in that "Words Don't Come Easy," will go in, in in the book. So, it was all this idea of archiving what we were doing since the beginning. And 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 we also, you know, because our budgets initially were very limited; they still are. But you know, uh, we were able to secure much better conditions for everyone over the years. Um, everything that we were doing was being shared online and online became a really important platform for us to document archive communicate uh on you know a very effective cost so if you go to our online presence whether the website the instagram uh facebook you'll see that it's not us that you won't see kunstal anywhere because we're silent this year but everything is archived there um and we were very aware that because as Jean said we didn't know how long we would last that something should remain um i'm gonna say a quote by um Gayatari spivak about uh, globalization uh, globalization only takes place in capital and data and everything else is damage control so um this quote is i think it's really important when it's come to the distribution of documentation so we take documentation seriously especially for the exhibition screening these kind of public event i know the image is important for the artists 
for their portfolio on the future uh, career. So we take, try to take best documentation as possible. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are a little bit critical about what image does. So <laughs> representation of artwork through documentation image doesn't really do what artwork does. And why do we, then why do we have that on the website? That could uh, give the misunderstanding of what experience of artwork might be. So we don't want to do the damage control of that. So we don't put that the documentation. But I think archive in the other side, archiving is really important. Uh, so our website is mostly link hub. So the the link for for the artists or the that they mention the. Uh, this kind of thing is everything on the website. So when we do the workshop, for instance, the, the workshop model, what kind of exercise we have done will be uploaded on the website so that it can be, so data that can be transferred to the other place. Uh, I think that also goes to uh, our local land um, uh, digital library called Hoho Library, uh, where Clara Burge made digital library of copied books. So when artists come, and that could be also part of archive of our activity, in a sense. I want to just add to that, that there's, um, I mean, this is a very complicated uh, question that has many <laughs> sides to it, but just uh, technically with the, with the library. So we have, a, we have a digital library on site, but it's a localized one. So you can only access it when you're in our space. Uh, which means that we can save digital uh, ephemera and production without necessarily making it, um, well, public is one thing, but also like to not upload it on the internet. So it, it exists, um, but it's still accessible to people without them having to ask us permission. So there's, a, there's like an access to that material when you're physically present in our space. Um, yeah. Even on the street. Even from the street, yes. So our neighborhood, like, like we don't actually know if our neighbors have all our files. That might be <laughs> true. I mean, we don't put the images on there, but we have um, a lot of pirated texts the way that, that makes sense for for the present, whenever that is. <laughs> um, when I opened, there is no website. And I had this fantasy of seeing how long I could last without having a website. Um, the next idea was to have a website that would only be open for a certain amount of hours so that it would somehow stop working for from this time to that time. But that somehow felt too silly. Um, again, for me, it, it all goes back to that picture I showed. Like that little place does not look like a website. It just doesn't look like it. Like it, it again. It goes back to scale for me. Like the internet is much too big for that space. Like that space is the quality or about it, and the scale, the value I saw in it had something inextricably linked to the scale of the space, the scale of the interaction, the scale of the one artist and one work, and 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 that's the opposite of the infinite scale of the internet, and it just seemed very incompatible. Uh, and so it just felt like it would be better to not have a website. Um, eventually we did, but, but, it, but, um, but again, as I mentioned, it was, it was just a, 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 a way to tell the story more publicly. There was no pictures, there was no, again, JPEGs, the way that they're kind of consumed at the scale, you can consume our activity in that way felt also incompatible with what we were trying to, what I was trying to do at the time. And it was much, much more about that face-to-face -face interaction and the scale of a face-to-face -face rather than the scale of the JPEG. And so, um, and also it's important to mention that, that um, nothing looked good photographed <laughs> in that room. I mean, it was a base, and it's not, it just, it just didn't look good. I mean, nothing. There's nothing interesting about a photograph of inside of that room, and it would, didn't do anything. And so, um, and so, why, why do that? 
And I mean, and that also extended to the book you made of it with no images. If I understand. Well, we have some we have some great and some hard hitting questions from the <laughs> audience, so or from other people in the room, and so I'm going to try to encourage some productive friction uh, <laughs> by asking certain questions um, from here. So, um, so I'm going to start with um, yeah, there's into the kitchen, and in that, that way, comparable to a thought through marketing campaign. <laughs> I mean, speaking from my perspective, there was a very big deliberate gesture to take a, pro a, a place that was very, that technically usually is very private, meaning on an upstairs floor of an academic building and to do the dramatic public facing gesture of pulling it downtown in a storefront let street level in a neighborhood with all, all huge amount of art traffic there is a huge gesture there towards trying to reach an audience trying to make something that is a in the academic context a kind of think tank private research discussion in to, to have that take place on the, on the street in the lower east side the door is open unlock you know to anyone who chooses to go everyone is invited you know um the only thing was that there was a specificity around this is an institute for an artist. So if Rosemary Trockel is someone who you don't find interesting at all, then I mean, I wouldn't even really expect you to stop in. But if for all the people out there for whom this artist is touching on questions that matter, this this place is open and everything is free and, you know, come on in. So I don't know. I, I always I always struggle with this. I think this this kind of, ex, you know, this kind of exclusive this this relationship created between small equals exclusive, big equals inclusive is a false uh, analogy, and I I, I don't accept that. Um, yeah. So what we presented today is kind of highlighting the the way that we because of the nature of of this this conference, like highlighting the nature of the the way we've tried to work with like semi public, semi private spaces, but yeah, we're also a street level um, front space that is, there's just like a sliding door between our apartment and that space as well. Like it's open, we live there, we're there all the time. We have our contact information available on our website. We're available on, um, for those who know the local, like um, the local scene, we're available in UFO which is like a, a place where you can look up all the galleries that are here also is a is a place for a lot of really interesting artist run spaces and people are used to navigating um i i think like from my own experience used to navigating and kind of being on top of understanding uh how to find the place we uh we do have a lot of programming that is completely open it is free it is a, it is um, public, uh, like lectures, screenings, exhibitions. Um, we do though have a little bit of like um, inconsistent time schedule, which maybe adds to the feeling of exclusivity. I wonder because of how it corresponds with our lives generally. Like this is not our only. Um, our only job, let's say, or like not our only project. We do a lot of things, both of us as um, as artists. And Louis Denis is also thought through and thought out to align itself with with life and the life of of an artist, um, which means that there are maybe a long periods of time where it seems like nothing is going, or where nothing is going on, where maybe it seems as if it is closed off from the general public, but it's just really nothing is going on because we're doing a lot of other things on this side. Um, but I do really recognize this question. I do really recognize the kind of problematic of that you're faced with when you run a when you try to run a space that um, that facilitates a certain kind of meeting between practitioners and. Uh, with art practices um, that is focused and committed and maybe takes a lot of time sometimes. Um, 
it is very demanding. And I think that that can be experienced as an exclusivity as well, which I totally recognize. But then I also kind of on behalf of Louis Tani, I feel like we never necessarily try to reach everyone all the time either. So it's it's kind of, yeah, it, it's it's a different, it's a difficult problematic, but within Oslo, there are so many great spaces that are, that are showing a lot of really interesting um, artists all the time. And these are readily available. And so to be another one of those spaces was never really our intention to do a, like once a month or once every two weeks exhibition opening. Um, and and yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that's that's all I have to say. <laughs> so, um, it, it's an interesting question, and and you know, everything could be um, everything could be understood as a publicity stunt in a way. You know, this could be a publicity stunt of all these institutions. Um, so it, it's it, it it's tricky how you kind of take that narrative of part, and and and. In our case, it wasn't so much about disappearing, but it was about withdrawal because as an institution, we were facing with a completely different set of situations that we didn't know how to engage with. And, and we could go on you know, doing business as usual, and we could end up being a 30, 40-year-old institution that keeps doing the same things over and over. And as Chris mentioned, then it's pointless. It's uninteresting. You know, it's, it's just a paid job. But the advantage of being a small scale institution is that we can do that. We have the intellectual resources, we have you know, the scale, we have all the things that require it to take this leap and decide that we won't do anything this year. We will stop and think and come back next year, hopefully with a much more interesting proposal, with a much more relevant proposal that can deal with you know, the context in which we operate. But while we do that, while we step back, um, the space isn't empty. The resources are being used. We invited, you know, four other institutions to present something, to, 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 to make their own proposal, which is different from Kunsthalle Lissabon in that same space. So instead of, you know, doing our own thing as we always do, we have other four institutions with a different view of the world, with different artistic interests, with a different engagement with local audience, if they choose to engage with the local audience. So we're actually providing the local audiences with four different experiences. So it, it, it's, 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 for us, it's really interesting. And, and hopefully um, we're not, we're, we're, we're learning. And, and we're testing uh, ideas and bouncing ideas off these partners. Um, so yeah, it, it you know it's not it's not a marketing strategy. I'm yeah. sorry, it's not. And the space is there and it's open and it's free. So it's... Yeah. I think this questions is kind of mix of um, question about accessibility. And I think in the contemporary date, uh, internet age, accessibility is understood as constant transparency access like once you click you get you get everything but what you get is just image mm -hmm. you don't get the rest of it and somehow that is understood as accessibility mm -hmm. but i think what we are asking is that if you send us email if you call us and i want to see the past show can, can i see it then we will give everything image our text and even we can talk about artists and I think that's the kind of difference between exclusivity and versus instant access. Uh, this like mystified. Uh, well, I also really liked um, in Louis Daney's discussion the the mention of you something like you can't be a fly on the wall. You can't just come since the scale of it and its intimacy. You you actually can't just be an observer. You are necessarily implicated in a, being a participant. Um, I know we're almost out of time. We have another very polemically worded question. That, um, but what I'm going to do is, given the timing, I'm going to put it into the room because I do think that we should be aware as we move towards the end of today and also workshopping ideas. 
we should be aware of both overlaps and interests and intersections as well as disagreements. And I think we should find a space maybe in the spirit of you know, Chris Krauss evoked total disclosure, but I think there's also like whether you do like radical candor, which is very American, <laughs> um, uh, American management theory, but the idea that there is a space to disagree and a space to also critique each other, but rather than doing this in the whole round, which I think this question asks us to do, I'm gonna ask the question then ask that maybe you guys continue the discussion in lunch for a moment and and make it a task to ask each other this question. So here is the question polemically worded. Are there aspects within the approach of your fellow panel members that you find problematic or just stupid slash naive slash arrogant slash uninteresting? And so, so I think that's a very direct question, but I think the way that I might reformulate it is to say, I'd love for each of you in the lunch break to ask somebody else on this panel a question that you um, you may disagree with and, and ask them about an aspect of their program or their communication that you take issue with because we're also here to disagree. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go into the lunch break and we'll meet back at 1.30 for the last panel of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for a great conversation. I. I, I love you. This is like the best. I'm sorry. I, I guess I can't disagree with all of you.